What are these things again? Yeah, hello. Hey, so when's the next video? The next what? Who is this? This is Crib Crusher, right? That, that, hello? Hello? Hey guys, Crib Crusher here. Welcome back to the channel. Hey guys, Crib Crusher here. Hey guys, Crib Crusher here. Hey guys, Crib Crusher here. Am I a YouTube? Well, it's been a while since I've done anything, which means that I've missed out on a lot of very special days. My birthday, Christmas, Cyber Monday, National Gazpacho Day, but worst of all, I missed out on the most important day of the entire year. In October, we shared the anniversary of our favourite Toys to Life game. Starlink Battle for Atlas. It really is bizarre to think that it's been 10 whole years since I first played Spar's Adventure. I've had this for a decade, this for a decade, this for a decade, I haven't had this for a decade. Spar's Adventure was the gateway drug that got me hooked on the series, and knowing that that was 10 years ago, I can feel the wrinkles developing on my face as we speak. While the series has been extremely content dry for a few years now, no one can deny that this is a very special occasion worth celebrating. So today, I'll be performing torture. So today we're doing the chopping vegetables while blindfolded challenge. Just kidding, what we're doing is much worse. One of my main complaints with Sparrow's Adventure was the overall lack of difficulty. The only things that truly posed a threat were the boss fights. The undead one specifically, like that entire fight was just steroids. The later levels did bump up the difficulty but by that point it was just too little too late. But Giants, being the superior sequel that it truly is, added a brand new feature. Difficulty options. Easy, medium and hard. The higher the difficulty, the stronger and bulkier the enemies become. But if you take on the challenge, you'll get given more XP and more gold. My preferred difficulty has always been hard mode. It's the perfect blend of a tough but also casual playthrough, which is pretty perfect I think. But once you beat the game on any of the difficulties, you unlock the ultimate challenge. Nightmare mode. Yeah, you already knew I was going to talk about that before you clicked on the video, so, um, let's go, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's cut to the Every game after Giants had a nightmare mode. It's become one of the staples of the series. Because it's actually pretty hard. So as a very special anniversary special, I'll be attempting to complete every single Scanners game on nightmare mode. Wait, that means I won't even be playing Spurs Adventure. Happy birthday. I honestly haven't played much Giants in the last few years, so not only am I a little bit rusty, but I also have the absolute delight of experiencing this game's nightmare mode for the first time. I'd heard some things about it, but I didn't really know what I was getting into. I should have done some research. But before we begin, let's establish some ground rules. First of all, once you start a fight, you cannot run away or move on from it. It's surprising how many enemies you can just ignore in most levels, but we won't be doing that. Also, no use of magic items, definitely no use of traps, no intentional glitches to skip battles, and the biggest one, no swapping out during a fight. Swapping Skylander when you're at low health is one of the biggest exploits in these games and it takes away a lot of the difficulty. So for this challenge, I can only swap Skylanders right before a fight or after I die. The first level went exactly how you would imagine. Chompies that you can kill by walking near them, and Archeans that are very poorly designed for warrior robots. Not much to talk about here, but Junkyard Isles hit me unexpectedly hard. Let me just tell you right now, you will have a much easier time with this game if you don't play as the Giants. Most of the Giants move incredibly slow and have massive hitboxes. As a Giant, how in the name of Glumshanks am I meant to approach here? I was stuck behind a narrow path with two bark demons constantly shooting trees at me, and even when I did manage to squeeze through, I had no idea how to win the fight. The bark demons made things very claustrophobic, not to mention the three archers bullying me from a different island, meaning I had no time to stop an attack. 
with 15 health left. I got hit by an archer and we're not off to a great start. Well, once I finally did kill the bark demons, I still had the archers to deal with. Since when can they do that? Apparently, when you're close to an archer, they explode. I decided to check and yes, they do this on every difficulty. I had absolutely no idea. So, what is there to learn from this level? 1. Don't use giants. And 2. If you see one of these in real life, kick it until it stops breathing. Rumble Town. I remember this level being much harder than the first two. And I was right. That's funny, you're normally meant to feel good after you get something right. My biggest mistake going into this game was underestimating the first few levels. Even on Nightmare Mode, I didn't expect them to be that difficult, so instead of using my higher level Skylanders, I wanted to play as my weaker ones to try and level them up. I am so bad at this game. Seven deaths. Seven. In one level. Hello and welcome to Tips with Crypt, where we point out some pretty obvious information that could maybe save your life one day. Tip number one, level up your Skylanders. Why didn't I do that? With Cutthroat Carnival, I finally started getting my act together. There was one very close moment when I had 20 health with two Goliath Joe chasing me, and actually, while we're on that topic, can we talk about the low health sound effect? As if things aren't stressful enough in a hard battle, a flashing red circle appears underneath you and an extreme droning noise starts playing over and over and over and as you lose more health, it starts playing louder and faster. I love it and hate it at the same time. Luckily I managed to survive and get through the rest of the level without much hassle. I was scared about facing the Executioners, one of the standout enemies in the early game, but as long as you're using a fast character, they're really no problem. I didn't remember Glacier Gully being difficult. Dementia perhaps. Slippery floors, small spaces and cyclops that are invincible while spinning is never a good combination. And then I realised that the executioners are a hundred times harder in this level. I cut it very close against an executioner and just when I thought I'd made it out alive, two more executioners join in. One executioner is manageable, but two yeah, I may as well stab myself with an axe to get it over with quicker. Thank god this level is so short, otherwise I would have been caught like this several other times, but we made it out with only one death. So over the course of the first five levels, we've died ten times. Right about now you're probably wondering why I didn't just restart the playthrough. It's not like anyone would have known. Good question. Well, let's waste no more time and get into the secret vault of secrets. I always remember this level for introducing the shield juggernaut, enough to keep a grown man up at night, but more on them later. The Conquertron sections on Nightmare Mode aren't any more difficult, so we can just leave them out. The rest of the level does not mess around though. We have a new version of the Archean Jouster, which now has a shield up when it's not attacking, but most importantly, when it does attack, it leaves a stupid shockwave on the ground. And these guys are even worse paired up with the Bark Demon. When they're both combined, the attacks are quite difficult to dodge. And we haven't even gotten onto the Shield Juggernaut yet. To beat them, you're gonna want to play as a fast character that can circle around them, but still dodge in case it's able to catch you. And even then, I still died. I just suck at this game. Do not use a giant. They can only just outspeed the laser, so one wrong move and they're dead. This level was another shameful display all around. Another 6 deaths added to the total. Willikin Village had some decent challenge with the Grenade Generals and Mace Majors, but the only death I suffered was at the hands of the Chompy Mage. This boss has two different phases that it constantly swaps between. You have his Chompy mode where he runs around and sends out Chompies. If you swap dimension, you can turn these normal chompies into Enfuego chompies, which deal damage to the chompy mage if he inhales them. And then you have his normal form, where he shoots tons of bullets at you. Red ones that damage you, and blue ones that heal you. This phase is mind-numbingly easy, since you can just change dimension to change the colour of the bullets. But the chompy phase actually caught me off guard. He's big and he runs around, 
but I'd never actually been hit by him in this phase. Well, just to let you know, it hurts. We bet the level with one death. Troll Home Security steps up the difficulty with its enemies, but compared to the start of the game, I'm dying a lot less. I must be getting good. This level brings in a bunch of enemies that you need to be careful with, like the D-Riveters, Inhuman Shields, and the Chompy Bots. And then we see the return of the Grenade Generals. Remember them from last level? Didn't really do anything? Well, they are back with an unhealthy vengeance. I cannot describe in words how annoying Grenade Generals are. The grenades deal massive damage, have pretty big hitboxes, and roll around the floor making it really hard to dodge sometimes. Actually, I described it pretty well. And the grassy section of this level is filled with hills and bumps. The speed that this grenade got from rolling down the slope is just terrifying. And I don't know if this was a deliberate mechanic or not. Despite how evil this level is, I only died once. Chaos's castle was going well, until the grassy section. What is it with the grass? You've got the spinning cyclops, which are silently some of the most annoying enemies in the game, mace majors, troll stompers, and can we welcome back the grenade general? So good to see you again. I'm joking. My first death was from... This game is not perfect, and I really mean it. Some of these deaths really fell out of my hands, and I wasn't expecting that from giants. Well, once we got into the castle, I just died and died. It was it was horrible. And guess who did the killing? This guy. Again. What? Um, no, no. So, um, I I just came here for the for the nice weather. You know, it's lovely weather this time of year. No, I haven't quit. Right? Okay, so. I actually only had a couple of deaths so far, so it's actually getting a bit boring. It's way too easy, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna hang out here for a while, take a break, you know, because it's just so boring. So I'm getting bored. You know, it's, it's not even that bad. Anyways, here comes Drill X's big rig. Anyways, here comes Aerial Attack. This level is literally just fighting. Even the parts without enemies can kill you. The first part of the level takes place on the Dread Yacht, which isn't exactly big. As a hub world, I think its size is perfect. As fighting grounds, not quite. And on the ghost ship, the pressure just continues to crush me. I was hanging on by a thread with Fright Rider, who I've realised is actually pretty fun when I die to... Come on! Oh, okay, cool. Now on to Drillex's big rig. You know, one thing that really does make Giants a hard game, along with the nonsense we witnessed last level, is the complete lack of invincibility frames. As soon as your Skylander is dropped into the game, you are completely open to attacks. <sighs> they are key in bombers. An enemy that was once more of a threat to the enemies than you, became the enemy that killed three of my Skylanders in about 30 seconds. There were two Archean bombers along with some other enemies. I was playing as Double Trouble. I send out an Ooga Booga. One of the bombs lands on my Ooga Booga, which I didn't realise, and then bam. Double Trouble falls. But do you notice that during this second of the death animation, the bombers have already thrown more bombs at me, so when I send another Skylander down, the bombs are already there to kill me. This vicious cycle carried on until three lives were lost. I luckily escaped after that. And this isn't the first time I've been punished for the lack of invincibility. This game is brutal. After that I was also killed by a blaze brewer. I had no idea the jumping did damage. This is the Drew Archer all over again. And then we get to the end of the level to face Drill X himself. He was a complete walk in the park. This boss was never difficult. He has very simple and easy to dodge attack patterns that never catch you off guard. And unlike other bosses, the later stages in the fight do not increase the difficulty. After all I've been through, I can admit, this was a pleasant relief. But we're sent right back to hell with Molkin Mountain, filled with spinning cyclops and grenade generals, what did I ever do to you? 
These enemies combined resulted in one of the closest fights I've been in, but I managed to survive. And then we're introduced to the slobbering Muttakis. These things suck. Initially all they do is shoot blobs at you which don't even deal any damage. They can also do a very slow melee attack, so overall your chances of dying in this phase are very slim. But when you deal enough damage to them, they become much faster and do a devastating swipe attack that never seems to actually hit. This enemy got the middle finger from Toys to Bob, the hitbox on it is tiny. There were so many instances where I totally should have been hit, but absolutely nothing happened. So this enemy is actually really not much of a problem. They at least still have the element of speed, which did catch me off guard and killed me, but that only happened once. Look at me acting all cocky, dissing the slobbering Marcus. <sighs> I died four times in this level. I also died to a bunch of spinning cyclops, as a giant might I add another time to a stupid grenade, and once from the Shadow Duke at the end of the arena. And now we move on to the Oracle. The main idea of this level is that you're given multiple paths to take, and this definitely does add some strategy to the level, especially on Nightmare Mode. The most important decision for me was whether to be small with giant enemies, or huge with tiny enemies. My mind immediately went to the second path, I mean, if the enemies are way smaller then surely they'll have less health and do less damage. Now that's what I call a regrettable assumption. And also, since the enemies are tiny, tons of them can fit into a small space like right here, and I am a massive target in comparison. This must be how the giants feel every day of their life. Suffice to say, this was a huge mistake. I haven't played the other path, but I already know that was the better option. I died three times in this section, and I'm gonna be honest, this part is pretty unfair. Definitely take the other path, unless you love D Rivers. I mean, I don't blame you. Look at that face. And now we've reached the last chunk of giants. These final three levels are filled with brutally tough fights, and of course we have that final boss at the end. Let's see how badly we failed this thing. Auto Gyro Adventure is probably the easiest of these levels, but don't get any ideas, it's still dreadful. At the start of the level we meet the genuinely scary Archean Duelist, one of the many problems we'll have to deal with for these final levels. This enemy has all of the ingredients for one evil ham and cheese roll, assuming the ham and cheese are evil. It has a standard lunge attack which is quite easy to avoid, but then it also has a swinging attack which I was not prepared for. And look at the size of its sword. No matter how far away you are, you can never truly be safe from its wicked hitboxes. And as the level progresses, they start shoving more and more of these duelists in your face, and they also put other enemies in the mix as well, like shield juggernauts. Luckily, at this point in the game, I knew that I would only survive if I used my highest level Skylanders, which meant that I pretty much had a handle on everything until the end of the level, which just goes insane with the enemies. Shield Juggernauts, Duelists, Blaze Brewers, Crystal Golems, there's just too much going on. So I died 5 times in this final section of the level, and also I died once at the start, so if I did the maths, that's too many deaths. And if you think it's going to get any easier down the line, then you would be dead wrong. But not as dead as Funkback after getting shot and eaten by zombies. Take me out to dinner first, am I right? <laughs> the Lost City of Arcus is definitely the hardest of the three levels. Mainly because 95% of it is dealing with insanely difficult enemies, and the other 5% is getting crushed to death by a barrel that is literally impossible to dodge unless your character is fast enough. Fun. So yeah, the enemies in this level are disgustingly strong. First up you have the Trog Wanderers, which you fight at the start of the level and never again. The more damage you do to one, the smaller it becomes, until it implodes on itself or something. But the annoying thing is, if you stop attacking it, it very quickly regains its health and returns to normal size. And just to make it worse, they attack in a large group, meaning it's much more difficult to focus on targeting one of them. And making things a whole lot worse is the Archean Sniper. This is another one of those enemies that's not scary on their own, but is terrifying when mixed with others. 
They hide under their stupid arcane manhole covers and literally snipe you with rifles. Okay, that's actually pretty cool, but they're still super dangerous, so make sure not to forget about them. Ah, oh, would you look at that? The Archean Duelists are back, which can only lead to more pain and suffering, so thanks, Bob. There's also the Trogmanders and Trog Pinchers, but they are literally nothing in comparison to the Archeans. I surprisingly only died three times in this level, but trust me, I was pushed to my limits. And with that, we reach the final level, bringing order to chaos. There aren't any new enemies in this level, but to make up for that, they brought back the Archean Jousters. Not the interesting new mechanic I was hoping for, but at least the level keeps that spicy difficulty. Right as we get into the level, we have a shield juggernaut and two snipers to deal with. Attacking the snipers is really dodgy, because they're only vulnerable just before they shoot you, so you need to time it out well or you will literally be shot dead. And another problem with the snipers is that you only get one hit on them at a time. This kinda sucks since the majority of the Skylanders tend to deal damage over time rather than doing one powerful hit. Oh, and just like that we are dead. I suppose the Jousters returning was more of a big deal than I made it out to be, because I forgot how broken their shockwaves are. And then I also died because Bob thought it would be a good idea to put a shield juggernaut in an area that has walls. And distracted by all this commotion, I forgot about the biggest menace of all. The stairs. Well, the duelists helped too, but still. I suffered 5 losses in total and we still have chaos to deal with. Well, this is anticlimactic. Super Robo Chaos is simply not hard. The first part is quite literally walking in a straight line for two minutes, and when the actual fight begins, there just isn't much going on. All you need to do is attack Chaos's hand while he sends out Archeans you have to watch out for. The weird thing is he only ever uses shield juggernauts and jousters. Where are the duelists? Where are the snipers? After dealing enough damage to him, you're then given a bullet hell section where you have to destroy the machine while avoiding its projectiles. Truth be told, I did die in this section, but if I was using a smaller Skylander, it would have been no problem whatsoever. And after that's done, it's basically the same thing again, but with more enemies and Chaos sometimes shoots lasers at you. To be fair, they look pretty cool, but they move way too slowly to be dangerous. And then at the very end, he sends out another machine, but this time you can still attack Chaos. And then you beat him. That's literally it. I've not deliberately tried to make this seem basic, that's just how it is. The fight only lasted for about 6 minutes, and as you've probably gathered with your massive brains, it's just not hard. But hey, we bet the game, and now I can enjoy the only thing I did this for. The infamous secret nightmare mode ending. It's all worth it. And with that, we conclude Giants on Nightmare Mode. As far as most massacres go, this was a pretty fun one. Giants absolutely nailed its Nightmare Mode. It's difficult enough to be worthwhile, and it adds some much needed extra content to the game. So now of course we need to see how many deaths we had in total. I'm sure this will be fun. <clears throat> okay, so we have 2 deaths in Junkyard Isles, 7 deaths in Rumble Town, 1 in Glacier Gully, 6 in the Vault of Secrets, 1 in Willikin Village, 1 in Troll Home Security, 5 in Chaos's Castle, 3 deaths in Aerial Attack, 4 deaths in Drillex's Big Rig, 4 in Molkin Mountain, 3 in the Oracle, 6 in Autogyro Adventure, 3 in the Lost City of Arcus, and 6 deaths in the final level. 39 deaths in the span of 16 levels. Could have gone worse I guess. Well, that was a wild ride. Uh, how many games do we have left? Four. With all that done, we move on to Swap Force. I've played a lot of this game, but bizarrely, this is also my first time playing through Nightmare Mode. Rest assured, I have much more experience with this game, so hopefully I won't embarrass myself any more than I already have. Anyone who's played this game knows that you can get creative with your kills. With the new mechanic of some attacks knocking your enemies over, or flinging them into the air, and of course being able to jump, you have more skills in your arsenal than ever before. Now, is this easier than giants? Yes. But how much easier? 
Let's find out. Level 1 was no trouble, I know, big shocker. And Cascade Glade wasn't much harder. Mainly because the Gobble Pods did all the work for me. With my experience, I knew how powerful the Greeble Blunderbuss was, despite being a level 2 enemy, so I played extra careful around them. But even with them in mind, level 2 was a breeze. What time is it? Oh, yeah, level 3. The obligatory difficulty spike. It's not a huge spike, but it's definitely noticeable. In this level, we're introduced to the Grumble Bums. What is that name? Anyways, they're basically just stronger versions of the Greebles, so they're still pretty easy to dodge. And the life spell punks are a mild annoyance at best. The only enemy that poses a fraction of a threat is the Grumble Bum Rock Shooter. But even then, you have to mess up quite a few times before they can actually kill you. You also have the evilized Bog Hog fight, which could have been difficult if there were other enemies involved. The only other thing to mention is the raft sections. I knew that if I was going to die in this level, it would be from the mines. I was able to make it through without being hit, which is great since I wasn't even sure if I'd survive one mine. Moving on to Rampart Ruins, we're reintroduced to the Archeans, and they are much tougher than the previous enemies. You have the Rip Rotors, which are really good at closing you into a space and can deal some big damage too. There's the Slam Shocks that have shields up when they're not attacking. They also shoot electricity when they slam on the ground, which I kept on forgetting about. And then you also have the Archean Knuckle Dusters, but we'll talk about them later. By taking my time and playing carefully, I got through some really tough battles, but it was only a matter of time before I slipped up, and sadly, Grim Creeper was our first victim. But other than that, we got through fine. And now it's time for our very first boss, Evil Glumshanks. There really wasn't much they could have done to make this fight harder, it's a very simple one. To begin with, you just need to lure him into the spikes with nothing else to deal with, but later on he starts sending out missiles which can get in your way. Things only really start to ramp up when the knuckle dusters are sent in. These guys do way too much damage, and with Grim Creeper having one of the lowest HP stats in the game, I made it my absolute priority to get rid of them first. Evil Glumshanks progressively sends out more missiles and more knuckle dusters, but if you manage to stay clear of them, you should get through without much hassle. Iron Jaw Gulch was smooth sailing. It introduces the Fire Gear Golem, which could definitely cause problems down the line, but that's all there is to say. Motleyville has another difficulty spike. I mean, what do you expect? It has two bosses. Evil Eyes Whiskers is the first one, and it's incredibly boring. To begin with, it only has one attack, which is very easy to jump over. Don't watch that. And then for some reason, I was also hit here, which meant that I was on the verge of death on the easiest part of the level. Okay, well, since it's on topic now, I need to talk about this game's low health sound effect and how much it sucks. I've made it pretty clear that when it comes to the giant's low health sound effect, I love how terrifying it is. But this one just doesn't work. It's more of a high-pitched sound this time, and it gets rid of so much of the tension the other one had. Unforgivable. I managed to get through the rest of the fight without being hit, but for some reason the gods hated Slobbertooth that day because he gets killed in the most unfair way later on. There was an Archean Slam Shock and some Greeble Heavers that I was naturally cautious of, so I decided to go inside to grab a stick of dynamite to kill them, but when I come back out, I instantly die. About halfway through the level, we reach a segment that I had been dreading from the start. The rail grinding. This is without a doubt the biggest killer in Motleyville. It's crammed with mines and not only can they kill you in about two hits, but they also move which is really hard to keep track of. And not all of them move, which led to me assuming the mine would go to the right, but I crashed straight into it instead. And this battle here was pretty intense. You have the slam shock, squeeble heavers, the cactus, knuckle dust. Wait, the, the cactus? Yeah, somebody should probably update the wiki. These things are evil. If it weren't for the stupid cactus, I would have dodged the knuckle duster and would probably still have the ape man himself by my side. The deaths, thankfully, end here. The second evilized whisker fight is a piece of cake, and Baron von Shellshock wasn't too bad either. Twisty Tunnels brings in the Cadet Crusher and the Boom Boss, two enemies that are obnoxiously strong. The Cadet Crusher leaves an area of fire after attacking, sort of like the Archean Jouster but with smaller hitboxes. Thank god. And the Boom Boss shoots two explosive barrels at you, and just look at this. 
Using Junebug's roller move, I easily got rid of the cadets, but then, at full health, I get hit by one of the barrels and die. Imagine being hit by both of them. We also meet the air spell punk and the air gear golem, who together are not very fun to deal with. But with one death, I was feeling pretty good, oh no. The fire viper. Just what I needed. The boss starts off pretty tame, you need to shoot both plungers at it in order to attack its weak spot and there is practically no danger at all. But then after some damage, the fire vapor sends out a bunch of fireballs that spin around and are pretty fast. But even if you do get hit by one, Sharpfin seems to have an endless supply of pizza that he constantly chucks at you, so everything is going relatively fine. Until my old nemesis steps out of the shadows. Bad invincibility frames. Shift is probably my favourite bottom half in the game because of its unique mechanic of having multiple lives. This is quite literally a lifesaver since there are tons of enemies that can kill you in one or two hits. But today, it was my demise. I had been hit by a moving fireball. Luckily I was using Shift, but as you can see there is a little animation that plays when the mechanic is activated and dead. There is literally nothing I could have done here. Anyway, you're then eaten by the viper and as you fall down its body, you have to watch out for the fire geysers, which you are given absolutely no time to react to. But after that, there's only three fire gear golems standing between you and victory. I decided to just run past them and hopefully destroy the crystal before they caught up, but with the crystal practically having no health left, they got to me and I had nowhere to run. I bet the boss and finished the level with three deaths total. Moving on to the last bunch of levels, we have Boney Islands. I didn't think I would have struggled with this level as much as I did, but here we are. At the beginning I was killed by a fire gear golem that was hiding behind the cargo which caught me by surprise and I was dead before I even realised what was going on. But the new enemies in this level, like the Spear Cyclops and Cyclops Gazer Mage, were not difficult at all, so no deaths from them. But the ice. The frozen water. That's what killed me, and the sad part is we're only halfway through the deaths. At two different parts of the level, we have a turret section, and we died once in both of them. Think of any turret section in any of the games. Think of how much it annoyed you. Think of how much of an inconvenience it was in your life. Well, this turret section is the turret section to end all turret sections. What is even happening here? The only word I can think of for this is irritating. I don't even really want to get into why I died in these sections, I just want to move on with my life. Using its dirty tactics, this level now has the current record in Swap Force of 4 deaths. But we bounce back from Boney Islands with 0 deaths in the Winter Keep. I really was expecting more challenge here. We only have 3 more levels in the game, so a part of me wants it to get harder, and another part really doesn't. One thing I noticed immediately in Frostfest Mountains is how claustrophobic it is. The majority of the level is narrow pathways, and even in some of the combat areas where you're given some extra space, it still feels incredibly tight. But with the help of some of my best Skylanders, I prevailed, and it was time to face one of the scariest bosses in the series, Mesmerelda. I really love this boss fight. The whole idea is that we have to survive each of her performances, and only after that can we attack her. And each stage brings up the difficulty by a ton. It starts off with just the puppets to avoid, which move in straight lines that are marked out before they move. The puppets are the only danger to begin with, and you're given a lot of time to get out of their way, so the first stage isn't too demanding. Stage 2 has the puppets flying at you at different times, which makes it a bit harder to keep track of. Mesmerelda also drops snowman bombs every now and then, which puts some multitasking into the mix. Stage 3 starts overlapping the puppets, giving you less time and space to avoid them, and the snowman bombs appear much more frequently. And then stage 4 is where the battle really gets ramped up with the spinning dancers. As you can see, there's a lot going on, and on nightmare mode, it only takes a couple of slip ups to die. However, the boss has a weakness. Despite everything that's thrown at you, there's a blind spot in the bottom corner. The snowmen can still get to you, but you can activate them by shooting them, so as long as you can stop the snowmen, you are completely safe from the puppets, the spinning dancers, and any sort of damage at all. Because of this, I was able to beat Mesmerelda with zero deaths. Now, I know it's not exactly the most dignified way to beat it. Phantasm Forest is very long and filled with some terrifying enemies. We have the Missile Mauler. 
Can you guess what he does? My guess is mauling. He shoots. A missile, congratulations if you got that one at home, but the twist is that after dodging it once, it changes direction and targets you again. Once again, my prior experience with this enemy came in clutch. I wasn't taking any chances against them, because I know how evil they truly are. But then after taking care of the missile maulers, I somehow died to the cadet crusher, even though I'm miles away from the attack. And then later on, I made the dumb mistake of being right in front of a missile mauler just before it shot. Hello, Tips with Crypt, back for some more blatantly obvious advice. In the majority of fights, you are far safer using a long range Skylander. Preferably, your character should have a strong melee move for when an enemy is vulnerable, but also a long range move for when you have to play more carefully. Thanks for listening. Standing before you is one of the most hated enemies in this game. Yep, just let the PTSD consume you. It fires out 12 bolts at max speed and just being hit by one of them does 217 damage. Getting hit by every bolt would do 2604 damage. Here is what will happen to you if you make a mistake in this level. Instant obliteration. Like the shield juggernauts, there is some benefit to doing the circle tactic, but when there's other enemies interrupting you, it's hard not to have a hard time. I came crawling out of the level with what life I had left with three deaths. After that, it was now time for Chaos's Fortress. If you're looking for a tough final level, this fits the bill. The level has a whole army of new enemies, including one that has three different attacks and a teleporting move. We also have the Magic Spell Punks, which have a really cool ability, albeit kind of annoying at times. Each section of the level introduces one or two of these enemies, but at the very end, the level brings them all together for one of the most hectic fights I've ever been in. The first death was strange. Spyrise is a very popular Skylander, and for good reason. One of his upgrades allows him to do a finishing blow on an enemy that's at low health, and he even gets some health back from it. I was pretty certain that this worked through enemy shields, but for some reason it didn't work on this enemy and I died. And the next death was also pretty strange. In the final area, there are goo balls being fired at you, just to make it that little bit harder. As you can see here, the goo balls go through the enemies, yet in this specific moment, the goo ball decides to stop and kill me. The third death was pretty stupid, I have no excuse. And the fourth and final one was another dumb mistake. But getting past that, we are now up against Chaos's mum. I like the idea of her, but her boss fight can barely even be called a boss fight because it's just fighting the evil eyes enemies seen throughout the game. It did get pretty close in the first round. Lucky for us, each part of the fight is in a different room split up by long corridors. Do you see any enemies? No? Well then our no swapping out rule doesn't apply here and we can obliterate the rest of the boss with spy shift. Ah, I love exploitations, but we're not done yet. One final massive kind of purple looking guy is stood in our way and I was very nervous. Super Evil Chaos isn't my favourite Chaos fight, but it's a good one, and I know I won't be let off as easy as I was in Giants. The first part is attacking his massive feet. Well, it's not very difficult, so now we go into his mouth. This is a weird fight. This section is filled with gear golems. I don't like gear golems. It's all manageable until Chaos creates one of the most horrible combos in history. You have the air gear golem, which takes up a ton of space and pulls you into its attack, and then you have the Tech Gear Golem, which can kill any Skylander with one of its attacks. Within 5 seconds, I was already at very low health. I knew I wasn't going to survive, but luckily, I was using Shift. I'm beginning to question your value. I had already lost my MVP, and I'd barely left a scratch on the Gear Golems. And then, it happened. With a little bit of synchronization, the Gear Golems pull off their special combo move. The tech one starts firing at me, and the air one pulls me in so that I can't dodge the bullets. I can't even be mad. That was beautiful guys, good job. One more Skylander was lost, and then we finally got rid of them. The next part was pretty easy, and the final stretch just requires some patience, but it's still pretty tense regardless. And then with some button mashing, we fly into Chaos's big forehead, and the battle is won. In hindsight, I can admit that Swap Force is easier than Giants but not by a massive degree. Some of the enemies in this game are on the same level of terror as the ones in Giants. Overall, this game's nightmare mode is very fun and made me remember how much I love Swap Force. You even get Flynn's Volcano hat as a reward for beating nightmare mode, which is a very nice touch. 
and the death count. Here we go. One in Rampart Ruins, three in Motleyville, three in Twisty Tunnels, four in Boney Islands, three deaths in Phantasm Forest, four deaths in Chaos's Fortress, and three deaths against Super Evil Chaos, adding up to a total of 21 deaths. Alright, you know what? That's two games done. That's enough. That's enough torture for one video, okay? I'm finished. I'm gonna play some Viva Pinata. No. 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 God, no. It's our best option. Throw everything you've seen so far out the window, because Trapped in Nightmare Mode takes the difficulty to a whole new level. When the game's hard mode has most people failing, you know the Nightmare Mode is going to be a treat. And for better or worse, this game is indeed very, very hard. When it comes to the mechanics of the game, there isn't a whole lot to mention. You can now attack mid-jump, which you couldn't do in Swap Force, which was slightly annoying. This allows you to dodge and deal damage at the same time, and this is a massive help in those moments when you're not given any time to stop an attack. Oh yeah, this game's also a broken mess. Nobody has played Trap Team, especially on the PS4, without noticing a few... things. Now, going by my rules, I can't use any intentional glitches, but if I were to stumble upon a random one that, I don't know, warped me to the credits, well, I wouldn't be complaining, let's say that much. Level 1 actually came out of nowhere with the difficulty. The Chompies are actually pretty tough to defeat, and in this game they can kill you in a couple of hits. Okay, I was lying. Level 1 was easy and boring. Sorry for trying to make it more exciting, jeez. Level 2 was also pretty uneventful. Slobber Trap definitely does have the ability to kill you, but only if you're playing as a slower character. One of the reasons this game is so notorious for its difficulty is because not only do you have boss fights at the end of levels, but you also have to deal with dozens of mini-bosses. They are very inconsistent in difficulty and don't usually meet the expectations of a real boss, but it's definitely a step up from just having a bunch of basic enemies to fight. Some of them can be just as threatening as one of the Doom Raiders, so don't take them lightly. But with that, we move on to Chompy Mountain. What level is this again? Oh no. Oh god no. Level 3. The difficulty spike. You play through on Nightmare Mode for the first time thinking, hey, this is quite easy. And then at the end, they send you to your deathbed with a fight that could easily be mistaken for a final boss. In level 3, the Chompy Mage is back. And he is transcended from a pretty forgettable boss that's mediocre in difficulty, to a boss that I don't even think is possible without dying at least once. See this man here? He is responsible for this fight. He is the sadistic father of this beast you call Chompy Mage. Does anyone have his IP address? Here is where we get into the real juicy goodness of Trap Team, because the boss fights on Nightmare Mode truly are nightmares. What makes these boss fights so interesting is that with each difficulty, the abilities and attack patterns of the bosses change, instead of it just being increased health and damage. They even change the fights on easy mode, which I don't think I have ever been on before. I have no idea why they focused on this specific detail instead of releasing a polished game, but hey, funny glitches. Chompy Mage starts off by summoning normal, Enfuego and armored Chompies, along with fire rings to avoid. This is already an intense, fast-paced boss, and we're only scratching the surface of the pain and suffering. Room 2 has Chompy Mage turn into a massive Chompy that slams all over the place, creating tons of shockwaves. Hello, welcome back to Tips with Crypt. Let me introduce you to Bullet Hell. If I were to give a definition of Bullet Hell, I'd say it's when you're forced to avoid a frequent or large amount of projectiles at once. So basically this. As Wallop, it's virtually impossible to attack without taking damage. Fortunately, this phase is on a timer, so all you have to do is last long enough for him to stop. But then again, it doesn't really get any better afterwards. For the final phase, he transforms into his Super Magma form. He begins this phase by doing ground slams that send out shockwaves and sometimes send out chompies as well. Since he stands in place, it's much easier to attack. It's still not exactly easy, but I'll take it. I was unbelievably close to finishing the boss with Wallop, but I simply couldn't keep up with the shenanigans. I was still pretty pleased to make it out with one death. First Doom Raider down. I only had one concern moving into Phoenix Sanctuary, and that was the Shred Knot. 
Not because it's a really hard fight or anything, no. For some reason, this specific area is a hot spot for glitches and bugs. It could be anything, but something weird always happens during this fight, and that's what usually leads to my demise. And who would have guessed, something weird happened. This isn't the flashiest glitch ever. You might not even notice anything at first glance, but when the Shred Knot walks over this platform, it starts sprinting out of nowhere. I actually had to check to see if this was something that Shred Knot was supposed to do, because looking closely, it actually looks like a proper animation. But no, it's just a really strange bug. And just when I thought I'd escaped with one death, the Shred Knot comes back to get one last killing. We got through the rest of the level without any more deaths. Chef Zeppelin is similar to Chompy Mountain, since when it comes to difficulty, both of the levels are really only known for the boss fights. You've got Bombshell to deal with, but there's not much to talk about there. So let's skip all of the turrets and sky stones and get to the interesting stuff. Chef. Pepper. Jack. This fight isn't as hard as Chompy Mage, but you'll still be lucky to win without dying. To begin with, the Chef throws out Pepper bombs that explode into pools of fire. After this he does a charge attack, which is your main opportunity to sink some damage into him. After a little bit of that, we have something that they just couldn't resist including. A bullet hell section. Lasers start moving all around the place and gradually speed up until you get something stupid like this happening. But surviving that marks phase 2. At the start of the fight we only had 3 bombs to worry about, but now we have 9. He chucks 5 peppers close around him and then another 4 that are further away. And the lava stays there for so long that it overlaps with newer pepper bombs, sometimes covering more than half of the arena. This is where chance comes into play. Sometimes you'll have space to move and sometimes you'll either have to damage through the lava or get smacked by the chef. And then we have yet another laser section with more to dodge. The direction of the lasers sometimes reverses and then there's that horrible part where everything stops and suddenly starts moving again. I barely managed to get through to the third phase. But what for? Why have I even tried to survive this whole time when phase 3 is a death sentence? He now throws out not 3, not 9, not even 15, but 19 peppers. You might have some small gaps here and there, but only if you're lucky. Look at this. This looks like some sort of hacked impossible version of the game, but it's not. All I could do was sit there and watch him charge into me. The last chunk of the fight isn't actually that bad though. He sends out stakes that you have to land on because the floor is covered in lasers. At the very end he stops sending out stakes to land on which forces you to avoid the lasers, but it's not as tough as it seems. Second Doom Raider down, and only with one death. Not much to talk about when it comes to Rainfish Riviera. Brawl Risk is as unbelievably annoying as usual, but not annoying enough to kill me. Monster Marsh is a very scary level, and not just because of the eyes and mud and grass and other scary things. It's also because this level introduces one of the most obnoxious enemies in the entire game. The Snozzlers. Does hearing that ring a bell? Probably not, because most people swore a vow to never speak its cursed name. They fly up in the sky and shoot balls made up of who knows what at you. The main problem with the Snozzlers is that you have to wait for them to stop attacking before you get a chance to kill them. This isn't the first enemy to behave like this. There were a good chunk of Swap Force ones that had the same idea, so what makes the Snozzlers so bad? Well, I hate to bring them up after all the pain he's caused, but they're similar to the Grenade General. Their projectiles don't explode as soon as they touch the ground, which means they can still get in your way after already avoiding them. And if you're fighting two or three of them at once, it just becomes a nightmare to get around the place. Well, thank you for listening to my essay on why I hate Snozzlers. I-5 is also pretty scary. As he starts attacking, he's incredibly slow, but the longer he slams his fists for, the faster he gets, until you either get hit or avoid him by the skin of your teeth. The arena at the end has Snozzlers, I-5s, the whole shebang, so I only just survived that. But guess what? The death I suffered in this level wasn't from the Dumbo Rejects, the final arena, or something that looks like it's from Monsters Inc. No. It was from the Walking Bean with Eyes which is called an oogler, but one death isn't too bad. When it comes to the enemies, Telescope Towers is practically identical to Monster Marsh. It does feature some difficult villains though. Hootsicle was a pretty close fight and Piñata, well, let's just say certain exploits were applied. And let's not forget about the Dreamcatcher, but before we get onto her, we have some Snozzlers and Ooglers to fight, and this is truly these enemies in their prime. 
If these enemies were seen more in the game, their potential for pain would be through the roof. I just, I just hate them, and I hate their stupid names. I, oh. Anyways, now we face off against the third Doom Raider, Dreamcatcher. From Chompy Mage to Pepper Jack, it's safe to say that the Doom Raiders have been a handful so far. So who knows what kind of challenge Dreamcatcher will deliver. I didn't lose a single health point throughout the entire fight, so no. She didn't deliver. I honestly don't understand this boss fight at all. Dreamcatcher moves from left to right firing tornadoes at you. She sometimes has a protective force field around her, and the only way to break that is by destroying the floating beds. And then in the second phase, the tiles that you stand on disappear after a second, and you'll take damage from falling. But that is literally the entire fight. There was even this one point where I was hit by a tornado, but instead of taking damage, it bounced off me and hit Dreamcatcher. The boss fight is either poorly designed, incredibly unpolished, or just straight up easy. I'm not sure which one. The only damage she's gonna deal is to your Wii after she crashes the game. Third Doom Raider defeated. Mystic Mel was pretty uneventful. One of the shortest and easiest levels in the game by far. The Secret Sewers on the other hand had some pretty difficult fights. Especially the arena which has a monster moving around leaving goo everywhere. Which trapped me into a corner. I'm sure you know how this is gonna go. I made it out with one death. And just like that we move on to Willikin Workshop, home to the 4th Doom Raider Dr. Crankies. What the funny bone nearly died because of whatever this was, but the rest of the level was manageable and relatively glitch free. The final stretch before the boss is pretty tough, so that was pretty tight, but with no deaths in the level so far, we face off against Crankies. This fight is hard I guess, but still, compared to Chompy Mage it really isn't that bad. As long as you remember to jump to help avoid the spinning move, phase 1 and 2 shouldn't give you any trouble. In the third phase he creates this wooden monster. I assume it hits pretty hard, but it's too slow to even come close to hitting anything sadly. Poor guy. And then in the final phase we have to deal with a second monster and crankies at the same time. It's a handful, but it's much better than bullet hell. The final phase also replaces half of the floor with a conveyor belt moving towards a massive crusher. Luckily, you can easily lure Crankies and the monster into the crusher, which deals tons of damage. Uh, hey, buddy, you, you alright there? Let's just put him out of his misery. Even though we were pretty close to dying by the end, I still think this fight is overhyped. Fourth Doom Raider down. Apart from getting punched by a bird, Time Town went smoothly, which means we have arrived at one of the most terrifying levels in the game. The future of Skylands is known for one thing and one thing only. Snuckles X9. Okay, we're going to. But before we even get to the second last Doom Raider, we have an army of Blastertrons to get through. Blastertrons have shields at the front, protecting them from any damage, meaning you have to attack them from behind. But it's not like they just let you do that. Most of the time they'll just turn around before you can even manage to attack, or just fly away. And let's not forget what the first seven letters of its name implies. It blasts you. It's just an incredibly annoying enemy to kill without getting seriously hurt in the process. And if you're not playing as a character with some sort of dash move, then you will literally die of old age before landing a single hit. The fight just before Wolfgang is the biggest roadblock. You have to fight two Blastertrons at once. I died. Enough said. Fortunately, the entirety of Wolfgang's fight is in an undead zone, giving me the perfect opportunity to switch into Crypt King. It's weird that I haven't already mentioned it, but on Nightmare Mode you should 100% be taking advantage of the elemental zones. If you don't have any good scanners for that element, it's not the end of the world. But it really does make a difference, and has possibly saved a couple of lives at some points. Anyways, time for the big bad wolf. On hard mode, the first phase isn't anything special. He does a knee slide that creates musical notes. And these fly at you whenever Wolfgang does his basic attack. After that, he jumps up and slams into the ground, which is your main opening for damage. Normally, the notes would disappear before the ground slam. But on nightmare mode, they only go away just before the next knee slide, which sends in more notes anyway. This makes it slightly harder to attack him when he's stuck since now you have to avoid the notes as well, but this is the only noticeable difference between the two difficulties. Oh yeah, and it also doesn't make it that much harder. In phase 2, you're stuck in the second dimension. He has the same attack pattern, but it's much more difficult to avoid him now since he's constantly in your face. The music notes are also much more annoying in this phase, Mainly because of how they line up when Wolfgang does a slam attack. Unless you time it very well, you're gonna get hit by something. Phase 2 is definitely a step up from the first one, 
but because of Crypt King's healing ability, I got onto stage 3 with full health. Well, I cannot say I'm surprised at this point. We have a bullet hell section. But this one is actually really fun. If you don't have a lot of experience with this fight, then you'll get on much better with the lasers as a smaller Skylander. But I've been through this part so many times that using one of the tallest characters in the game didn't even make much of a difference. You might be thinking that so far this is going way too smoothly, and compared to the final phase, you are absolutely right. Imagine taking the second part of the fight and putting it together with the laser section. Oh wait, you don't have to imagine, because it's literally what I'm having to deal with right now. My memory of this final part was just a blur of lasers and musical notes, but looking back at the footage, yeah it's still a blur of lasers and musical notes. Even with the healing I was hanging on by a thread. There are certain parts that just seem impossible to avoid no matter who you're playing as. But alas, we finished off Wolfgang with our favourite king still in one piece. Relatively speaking. Beating Nightmare Wolfgang without dying is certainly an achievement, but we don't have time to celebrate just yet. For a level all about fighting, Operation Troll Rocket Steel was pretty uneventful. <clears throat> Apart from the threat pack fight at the end, but let's move on. Sky Highlands is a scary level with very scary birds. Even just the first couple of fights were intense and by the time I reached Tycoon Crow, I was practically already dead. The final set of enemies was the most heart pounding, butt clenching, sweat inducing fight I've had so far. The amount of satisfaction I got from levelling up and getting my health back, it can't be measured. Tycoon Crow himself was a bit of an anticlimax. Most of the one on one villains don't tend to be much of a problem. Most of them. Golden Desert is up next. And I'll be honest, the only thing this level has ever had going for it is the difficulty. Near the start of the level I got jumped by the Bone Chompy, and don't let his looks deceive you, this is actually a pretty tough villain. But as the master of trap team that I truly am, I knew that if you get him to pounce at the right spot, then he straight up disappears into the void. So I dodged the Chompy shaped bullet there. I'd say that the most difficult part of the level is this part inside the temple. You have some very bulky and hard hitting enemies like Grave Clobbers and shield skeletons. I wonder why no one remembers their name. I felt claustrophobic, helpless, and most importantly, wondering why the hell the bombs didn't deal any damage to the grave clobbers. We managed to make it to the arena fight though, which gives us a ton of lovely space to run around. Apart from the... the transformed barrel, are you kidding me? That refused to throw bombs my way to blow up the pillars, the arena was pretty simple and grave clobber went down insanely fast with gear shift. So that means it's time for the Lair of the Golden Queen. Oh boy. This level starts off feeling pretty much the same as Golden Desert, until one of the most horrific enemies reveals itself. The scrapped undead villain, Eyeball Dragon. This thing is a sadistic monster. Clearly still a bit salty from the villain rejection. It sends out tons of eyeballs which drop down at you. After they've all dropped, they explode one by one into little projectiles that go in four directions. You literally cannot stop moving when this enemy is around. Even after the attack is done, it isn't long before the next one and you'll be running for your life again. As long as all your concentration goes towards the eyeball dragon, you should be fine. You should be fine. I'm not exactly sure if this death was my fault or some sort of wacky hitbox. Either way, Shortcut is dead and there's no point crying about it. But after dealing with bad juju, nothing was stopping us from reaching the leader of the Doom Raiders and quite possibly the hardest one. Golden Queen. Cue the music. To start with all you have to do is watch out for the shockwaves, but there isn't much point in me talking about this start since I literally bet phase 1 in 20 seconds. In the second phase she alternates between her shockwaves and her royal turrets. These things send out a long row of blades that fly at you in a straight line. The difference on nightmare mode is that they basically never stop firing, so destroying them should be a main priority. And um, well, look at that. Already more than halfway done, and it's all thanks to Wallop. He might not be perfect in every situation, but I swear he is the best scandal against this boss hands down. He destroys the turrets in mere seconds, and might possibly have the highest damage per second in the entire game. There's a part where she becomes a golden orb, and you have to jump around to avoid being crushed, which is cool, but it's not really difficult. And now we're stuck on a very small platform with four turrets blasting at us. It's important to remember that every turret drops a piece of food after destroying it, which is surprisingly generous for this game. It's easy to get rid of the first two turrets, but by the time there's one left, you are bombarded with blades. If you can follow the pattern, you might just be able to make it to the next phase of life. 
and we are truly in the endgame of the fight. Golden Queen becomes massive, but she doesn't recover any of her health, which was surprising. Wallop. What did you just do? This is the most bullet health part of the fight, and while the shockwaves move at a regular speed, the blades are much slower, which makes the whole thing disorienting and weird. You also only get a very slim opening for attacks, so this phase lasts for a while. <sighs> it was only a matter of time before I died, let's be honest. With that done, we reach the final phase of the boss, and this is where it gets insane. I had six turrets circling around me and no wallop to carry me to the end. I'm sorry, Jawbreaker, but you're just not wallop. A good idea is to try and target one turret, but I got mixed up and just started attacking whatever was closest to me. Pro tip, not a good strategy. I was able to take three of them out with Jawbreaker, but probably not the best character to choose. After you get rid of all the turrets, you straight up get chased by Golden Queen. Even though this is even slower than the Robo Chaos one, the fact that if she catches you as an instant KO was enough to make it terrifying. But alas, we crush her to death and the final Doom Raider is defeated. Unless you count Chaos. But if you do, you're wrong. Speaking of which, here we are at the final level, which honestly is a bit of an anticlimax. The only spicy part is against Smoke Scream, but once you get rid of all the enemies, you can easily outrange him. So with nothing else in our way, we go up to pay a certain bald man a visit. No enemies, no distractions, just you and Chaos. In the first section, all Chaos does is a basic shockwave move that you have to jump over. While shockwaving, he has a force field sort of thing around him that damages you if you get too close. In the normal difficulties, there are only two shockwaves, whereas here he sends out four of them at a much faster rate. And on the fourth shockwave, another three shockwaves appear from the edges of the arena, which then overlap with Chaos's next set of shockwaves. That's a lot to digest, and this is only the first part of the fight. If you're playing as a close range Skylander, you're rarely given any opportunities to attack, especially with that force field stopping you from getting close. So you'll definitely want to play it safe and be using a long range Skylander, since the force field doesn't really affect them at all. Now I expected the first part to be a piece of cake, but I played super impatiently and I was way too focused on dealing as much damage as possible and all it took was a few hits for Snapshot to go down. Tips of Crypt, always stay in front of Chaos. With the force field blocking some of your vision, it becomes so much harder to time your jumps and I did learn this the hard way. And then I stupidly tried to change gears which slowed me down way more than I expected. Another death in the very first section. When the next segment begins, Chaos stands still for ages. Take advantage of this and deal as much damage as you possibly can. I was luckily using the perfect Skylander for this. The complete madman, nearly conquering Golden Queen all by himself, Wallop. If I had an MVP for this game, it would probably be him. Phase 2 brings in the element of bullets. If you touch a bullet which has your element on it, you heal for 10, but any other element will damage you. This attack is pretty much just a way to involve the villains in the fight, because if you swap to a villain with the right element, all of the bullets will be destroyed and you still get all the health points. You can just keep on doing this over and over again, making this part brain dead easy. But since we're not all villains, it won't be that simple. Most of the time, one of the two bullet types will be your element, so you only really have one to worry about. But when both of the bullet types are out to kill you, oh, prepare for some fun. And a fun little Nightmare Mode exclusive is the Chaos Bullet. If your Skylander gets hit by one of these, instant death. I'm serious. 9,999 damage. Probably best to avoid these. He still throws out his Shockwave move and he can even use it at the same time as the bullets. This can really test your platforming skills, but overall this section is still easier than the first one. First of all, during the bullet sections, he will literally just be there, almost asking to be smacked in the face. He doesn't move around as often in general, and he doesn't attack as frequently. And for the third phase, everything stays the same with the addition of the Doom Sharks. Funnily enough, another way to heal up your Skylander. Just like how they worked in Sparrow's Adventure, when you get really close to a shark, you heal up. You can get a ton of health if you do it right, but it is pretty risky, especially since only a couple of hits are enough to kill. But luckily, the Doom Sharks never combine with any of the other attacks, which makes it a lot easier to just focus on healing. Just like last time, he stands around laughing at nothing while you beat him to death, so still not incredibly difficult. But, 
Just as you think you're getting the hang of things and you realise that Chaos only has half of his health left, he heals 2500 health and whips out a pair of swords. Now Chaos does the sword move which will be your main opportunity to strike during this phase. Along with that, the area of his force field is far bigger and wait for this. He now shoots 6 shockwaves and you know those 3 shockwaves that appear at the end of the attack? How about we double down? The shockwaves now come out so fast that the only way he'll be able to keep up is if you jump over 2 of them at once. It may seem scary at first but once you get the hang of it, it's not too bad. You are given a decent amount of time to attack after this, but since you'll be so busy with those extra 6 shockwaves, you might not even get to him quick enough. But both the shark attack and the bullet stay the exact same. Thank Glomshanks. He fought well, he fought hard, and he fought for a long time. But eventually, the insanity of this fight caught up to Wallop, and he died. Rest in peace. And then, when you think you've nearly defeated him again... Yep, I bet you didn't see that coming. He grows a pair of black angel wings, what, why? Anyways, this part, as you would hope for the final stretch of the boss, is definitely the hardest. He has a brand new attack, which can only be described as a roll of dice. I'm not even sure if your brain can physically react this fast, so it ends up just being about jumping around and hoping for the best. There's a few different patterns for this move. Some are quite short and easy and give you a lot of time to attack chaos. The others are incredibly stressful and hard to survive. The bullets remain the same once again, but the doom sharks are faster and they're in new patterns which are much harder to avoid. But the biggest change with the doom sharks is that chaos can now use his shockwave attack alongside it. The new and improved Doom Sharks are a pain by themselves, but throw that into the mix, and I don't know how much more of this I can take. Just, j just look at this. Pfft, I'm not getting paid enough for this. Oh wait, no one's paying to torture me at all. Oh wait, no, it's done. Cool. Well, we took down Chaos with only 11 deaths. 11 deaths. Wow. Overall, Trap Team's Nightmare Mode is a fresh and exciting experience. It somehow feels extremely unfair because of how strong the enemies and bosses are, but somehow fair at the same time with all the powerful new scanners you can use. And of course, as tradition, you get a couple of swanky looking hats. Well, now I have a fraction of a reason for doing this, so that's great. The death count is surprisingly low for this game. One death in Chompy Mountain, two in Phoenix Sanctuary, one in Chef Zeppelin, one in Monster Marsh, one in Telescope Towers, one in the Secret Sewers, one death in Time Town, one death in Future of Skylands, three in the Lair of the Golden Queen, and a very nasty 11 deaths against Chaos, resulting in only 23 deaths in total. Final verdict, before playing, please associate yourself with the words bullet and hell. Well, I've came this far, so let's play the car game. Initially, I really wasn't looking forward to superchargers. Not only do I find it to be the least enjoyable of the six games, but I also remember my previous Nightmare playthrough being really tedious and really unfair. This game is so easy, what was I even thinking? The game does seem intimidating at first, since you have two completely different gameplay styles to not suck at. But because of this, the combat outside of a vehicle feels like a bit of an afterthought. And it shows with how well I did in this playthrough. Let's do that cool thing where we like, transition. The first level is a cakewalk, so is the second. But the third, Cloud Kingdom, is where we meet Lord Stratosphere, our first vehicle boss. This is where a lot of the game's difficulty comes from, because you simply aren't as good in a car compared to moving freely and having tons of different ways to fight. And despite this fight being incredibly basic, with only three different attacks, I was still able to die after being smacked with a floating electric ball, we'll go with that. Besides the one death though, it's been pretty smooth sailing. <laughs> We're avoiding all of the sea and sky sections, I thought I'd let you know that. And then literally in the next level, we have to deal with Count Moneybone, another vehicle boss. This level's difficulty is spiced up a tiny bit, but I've still got it under control for now. And I didn't actually find Moneybone all that difficult this time round, even though last time I died like 5 times. It's just incredibly tedious, but you'll get there in the end. Just be extra careful of this purple charge attack. Obviously, you're meant to go through the portal to avoid it, but just really make sure you get through in time. It deals a little bit of damage. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, uh, Tips with Crypt, welcome back. Don't even attempt this game on Nightmare Mode unless you have either the Shark Tank or the Shield Striker. 
I swear to Glumshanks, the game is straight up impossible without using one of these vehicles. Case in point, the stupid chompy cars. These things are very fast, and unless you're already moving away from them before they lunge in for a bite, they're also very hard to dodge. Unlike the Bone Chompy, they latch onto you which is extra annoying. The only way I could deal with them is by constantly using the Shield Striker's shield, or burying underground with the Shark Tank. Only because of this was I able to beat the boss with no deaths, so it ended up that Money Bone wasn't even the real threat here. How lame. Next we have Battle Brawl Island, and this level is basically just an arena fight. I do not remember this game's normal combat being so freaking easy, but we bet all of the mini bosses and spell slams are without breaking a sweat. Spellpunk Library is one of the more difficult levels. Being stuck in 2D makes it much trickier to avoid attacks, especially from the fire and water spellpunks, my god. But alas, we made it through with no deaths. Barely. Gladfly Glades is up, and wow, we are already halfway through the game with only one death. That is honestly pretty incredible. I mean, do you remember how I performed in Rumble Town? Makes me sick to my stomach. Anyways, this is the first level without a vehicle boss that has hard vehicle sections. There's a lot of enemies and a massive foot trying to crush you, whoops. Sadly, another death is added to our total, but I made it through the rest of the level with only a few close moments. Clux HQ is another level devoid of any challenge. Instead, it brings us pain mentally with the worst boss in the game. And then we had Monstrous Isles, which has three different boss fights all outside of a vehicle. This is really refreshing, and I respect it for that. I didn't die to any of them, but that's not to say they were easy. I did die, however, to the road. I was in what I thought was a normal vehicle section until the ground started erupting. These fissions along the road do a ton of damage, and there I was thinking it was just a cosmetic effect. The nerve of vicarious visions. Speaking of dying, Ridepocalypse Demo Derby is like Battle Brawl Island, but it's only vehicle combat. How fun. In the first round, I was killed by a bunch of those stupid chompy cars. I would have swapped out to the Shield Striker the moment I saw them, but I have to stick to my rules, so after Spitfire's funeral, it was time for a killing spree. I was feeling the heat after one round of this crap. Judging by our very early death, who knows what else is down the road. Round 2 is everything I hated about round 1 times by 5. The arena is all over the place now. There are tons more enemies to deal with at once, and guess who's back? The stupid chompy cars. High Volt died, Terrafin died, Fiesta died all in one round. That's not great, but I'm happy to report that the third round is probably the easiest. This is mainly because there's only one enemy to deal with, and it's not even that good either. I did lose Smash Hit to the Beast, but after that it was all done. Five deaths in one level. I was seriously getting frustrated at the game's controls at this point, but I knew we were nearly finished, so I kept on going. As the third last level, I did expect some challenge from Vault of the Ancients, and I kinda got it. I got an unlucky death at the very beginning because I straight up didn't see this weird looking projectile. It really doesn't stand out as something you're meant to avoid. Anyways, I also died during a fight near the end. I made a mistake, fair enough. But honestly, since my run's going so well, two deaths is more than acceptable. The Bandit Train highlights a mechanic that I didn't really feel the need to talk about until now. If you didn't know, when you fall off a ledge in this game, you take damage. Something that only ever appeared in this game, and I'm glad they ditched it in Imaginators. Maybe it was just me being impatient, but I really found the platforming in this level hard, and with every mistake, I slowly noticed how much damage it was actually dealing to me. With barely any health left from all the falling I was doing, I was sadly killed by one pathetic little grenade. And then with the boss at the end, the game straight up glitched. Even though my shield was clearly up, I was still hit by the pirate dude. Very uncool, but I'll still count it. And just like that, we've reached the final level. Even in the epic finale to the game, I had no trouble with any of the enemies, and practically waltzed right into the final boss. Which, of course, is the man you all know and love, Emperor Chaos. This is a pretty neat boss fight, it does something original, and by some sort of miracle, it's not in a car. It does end up being pretty underwhelming on the difficulty side of things, especially after the beautiful hell that is Trap Team Chaos, but hey, I'm just glad it's over. 
Well, we completed Supercharges with an incredibly low death count. You didn't really think this was over, did you? Well, it looks like out of nowhere the darkness is here. I wasn't expecting this. Luckily, I was. So I made sure I started off with the Shield Striker, truly the MVP of this run, and it's about to be a massive help. He normally sends out crystal pillars that you have to avoid, but sometimes sends out rings that you need to drive through. Once you drive through enough of them in a row, you charge right into them and have a chance to do a lot of damage. It's very important that you don't miss the rings, because you'll have to start all over again. And when we get to the harder parts, you'll want to charge up the attack as quickly as possible. Repeat this process a few times and you'll enter the second phase. The main goal here is to survive. All you do is drive along a road filled with crystal obstacles and eventually you'll get to boost into him. It is easy. If you neglect the killing machines blasting at you constantly. But surely you can just avoid their attacks, right? Wrong. Literally wrong. If anyone knows how to avoid the blasts then please comment down below cause I literally have no clue. If it weren't for the shield striker, I'd be dead 10 times over. These things are actually disgusting and completely unfair. I don't know what they were thinking when they made them. Anyways, the darkness actually has a proper attack now. He sends out a turret that scans the area in front of it. Once it spots you, it starts to shoot lasers in that area. Easy to dodge by itself, a bit harder when there's a lot going on. And with that we return to the normal area for the final phase. There are tons more crystal pillars that move way faster. The rings are a lot harder to pass through as well, which led to me getting attacked way more than necessary. And the laser things are here as well, only there are now two at once. But it doesn't get any crazier than this. Granted, it is really difficult to focus on everything at once, but if you know what you're doing, this is more than manageable. Sadly, a pillar hit me out of nowhere and High Volt was down. Luckily, I called upon the Shark Tank to cheat. I mean, finish the boss fairly without any overlooked exploitations. I got super close to killing him, but Terra Finn was taken out too, leaving up to Spitfire to finally finish the fight without any more fatalities. There were a lot of Fs in that sentence. Well, we handled that pretty well. The entire game, actually. Apart from one specific level that I just can't put my finger on. There were so many things I didn't even talk about that could seriously affect how well you do like the vehicle upgrades, supercharged combos and the perks you get for ranking up, but you don't really need any of this because the game isn't all that challenging. Well here's the death count, one in Cloud Kingdom, one in Gladfly Glades, one in Monstrous Isle, <coughs> five in Redpocalypse, two deaths in Vault of the Ancients, two deaths in the Bandit Train and two deaths against the Darkness. Fourteen deaths is something that I'm pretty proud of, don't take that out of context please. Final verdict of superchargers? God, please have the Shield Striker. I actually beg of you, please. After playing through it a couple of years ago, I was sure that Imaginators was the easiest game on Nightmare Mode, but after Superchargers, I don't think that's even possible. Well, it would certainly be the easiest game if you used the Imaginators. Depending on how many senses you have in your collection, these bad boys can reach up to level 64, but without any senses, they can only reach up to level 15. But even at that level, as long as they have good enough weapons and gear, they will still be stronger than the majority of the senses. In fact, the main reason this is one of the easier games is because of how good the senses and imaginators are in comparison to the enemies. A little bit more of a buff to the enemies, and this would have been a very solid nightmare mode. So to make things less easy for myself, first of all I will not be playing as any imaginators, and I will also be attempting every battle gong challenge. I also did this in my previous Nightmare playthrough and it really spiced things up. And I totally forgot to talk about the Sky Chi moves. These are basically just a get out of jail free card when you're in a fight, so the only time I'm able to use these is during the battle gongs. I mean, come on, I shouldn't even be doing them anyway, so why not? I spent the first couple of levels playing as the few senses that I hadn't already maxed out. This game's pretty generous with its XP, so it didn't take long for them to get to a decent level. The first level? was easy. This should be no surprise to you by now, so let's move on. Mushroom River was also a walk in the park. It did get a little bit scary at the battle gong, but I made it through. And then, level 3 happened. What is it with level 3 in these games? Where did I first die in Trap Team? Level 3. Where did I first die in Superchargers? Level 3. Notice any sort of pattern? And so of course, I met my inevitable doom in Scholarville to the Bazooka Doomlander. 
Luckily the second boss, the evil sea monster, is very simple. They could have at least increased the speed of his attack or something, but as long as you don't play like an idiot, this fight won't seem any more challenging on Nightmare Mode. Shellmont Shores was no problem. Sky Fortress was going fine until the battle gong at the very end, which is probably one of the more difficult ones, because look how freaking tiny the area is. Rest in peace, Grave Clobber. <laughs> he was such a handsome young man. Fizzland was easy with a capital E. Its battle gong is literally the opposite of Sky Fortress's. Look how lovely and open it is. I remember the Ninja Doom Lander being a pain, but it was nothing. Well, so far this is looking to be the easiest game on Nightmare Mode, with Super Chowders being a close second. But, will the Golden Arcade change everything and flip my near flawless run on its side? No. It's got like 5 enemies in it. I'll admit the Smash of Doom Lander at the end is the hardest fight yet. First of all, it's in 2D, I probably don't have to explain why that makes it harder, but also during the final phase you have fire spell punks shooting at you, and if you're in the wrong spot at the wrong time, it's basically impossible to avoid them. Luckily some of the senses are able to kill them, because they are a serious pain. By some miracle with bad juju, I bet the boss without any deaths. Child labour for the win. Dragon Temple is up, and we're already approaching the end of the game, it has been a piece of cake so far, I hope it isn't screwed- Oh man. This level has some pretty decent challenge, with the dumb sheep that slow you down and then the other sheep that, you know, just hit you and stuff, you have to be careful. But only one death, and it wasn't even against the Bowsinger Doomlander who everyone cries about all the time. We are just blazing through Imaginators, I'm sure you've noticed. The game did too, because now we're at the worst part. The awful, dumb, filler content cake park quests. These are pretty simple challenges. There are some in the arena, some in the battleship, and even some are like mini levels. And sadly, this is where we lost a very handsome young man. For the second time. And since I actually cannot find the footage of him dying, here's a reenactment of what happened. It's very upsetting to watch, I know. And after an entire hour of that nonsense, we are at the abandoned amusement park. That name is bad enough to kill my entire collection. Anyways, this level put my sensei-ing skills to the test. Sure, I only died once in the actual level, but the final Doomlander is no joke. I present to you, the quick shot. If it weren't for my previous experience with this boss, my senses would be dropping like flies. The boss is fine to start with, but in his second phase, he sometimes shoots out this red projectile that bounces all over the place and there is no indication of where it's going next. Sure, it does spice up the fight, but it's more frustrating than challenging. He put up a good fight, but Pit Boss was down. And then when we get to the final part, he starts shooting two of them at the same time. I totally forgot he did that, and it was a nasty surprise. But by some inexplicable force of God, I finished the fight with 9 health and only 2 deaths for the whole level. Now onto the Lair of Chaos. I've heard that name somewhere before. This level has some pretty tough enemies, and they're all Chaoses. You have a basic punching one, a shockwave one, a basic projectile one, and a projectile lobbing one. Types of enemies that we're certainly familiar with. Oh yeah, and you have these jetvac robot things to help you, but they really don't make any difference, especially since they're up against nightmare mode enemies, and they die after like two hits. Kinda forgot they were even there to be honest. The level as a whole is kinda hard, I mean I did die as Mr. Cat halfway through, but the true main event of the level is the battle gong. You thought I was going to say chaos, but not really. Despite the chaos clones sounding easy to deal with on paper, they are extremely bulky and when tons of the different types are attacking you at the same time, it's pretty hard to focus. Why do I keep doing this to you? I was able to beat it on my second attempt, but it was rough. Well, here we are, at the end, let's wrap this up. Chaos, do your ridiculous anime transformation. Yep, there we go. This version of Chaos might look pretty chad, but believe me, it's probably the most underwhelming final boss ever. Something that's great about the Chaos fights is that they all bring something unique to the table. But Super Chaos literally has zero new attacks or abilities, unless you count sending in Doomlanders, which let's face it, you aren't. And you can just ignore the Doomlanders too, they just disappear after a couple attacks anyway. And Chaos is doing the exact same boring shockwave move through the entire fight. Not to say it's the easiest boss ever though, I did die, because, wait, why did I die? 
but whatever. Comparing the fight to basically every other iteration, it's just a really smelly way to end a really fun challenge. But just like that, we have bet every Skylanders game on Nightmare Mode. Well, Imaginators did end up being the easiest game, only because of the stupid chompy cars, but my therapist said I should avoid talking about them. And the death count is one death in Scholarville, one death in the Sky Fortress, one in Dragon Temple, one in the Cake Park quest, two in the Amusement Park, and three deaths in the Lair of Chaos. Nine deaths? Well, I think I deserve a glass of delicious cranberry juice for that. <coughs> that number. It haunts me. 106 deaths. That's like. That's like a hundred deaths, plus six. I'm a mass murderer, and it's not as fun as I expected. In conclusion, Nightmare Mode is a feature that I have really grown to appreciate. Even though it's really just the same levels and enemies and bosses with stat changes, there is a lot of value in a Nightmare Mode playthrough, and a lot of fun to be had as well. And then you have Trap Team, which actually puts a lot of effort into changing up the boss fights, which is really cool. And if you think Scanners is a game for kids, Ask a seven year old to beat this without dying. Well, I am actually pretty hidden here, so I suppose I could just lie low for a while, let this whole serial killer hype die down. So hopefully I'll see you soon. Hopefully. And don't tell anyone I was here.